Okay, guys, I'll just give one more minute for the students to join. We'll be discussing about the rest of the gram positives. And I've shared a question video for the group, but I will be discussing the questions anyways in the, these two days with you guys with regards to bacteriology and mycology mostly. And mostly, we'll, best, we'll just be doing the gram positives questions majorly. Okay, so I'll just give a minute for everybody to join. yeah okay so the first concept after uh i think the last concept we did is, is clostridium mystery right the three types of clostridium the four different organisms four subtypes so the next organism is colony bacterium diphtheria okay so let's say first i'll tell you the points that you have to remember with regards to that so we have a patient who's a uh, gram positive broad okay and they're basically coming corny means the meaning of corny c-o-r-y-n-e it's basically club shaped the meaning of that is it's club shaped okay so the important point is that see corny bacterium they will always give you as a case scenario of a grayish white membrane a grayish white membrane okay which is basically there on the oral cavity okay so that is one kind of presentator it's called a pseudo membranous pharyngitis or grayish white membrane which is also called as a pseudo pseudo membranous pharyngitis which is different from your colitis pseudo membrane colitis okay so now they can give you a case scenario of cardiomyopathy okay the reason is because cornibacterium diphtheriae they can it's not uh the cardiomyopathy is like a most common cause of death if the patient has actually having cornibacterium diphtheriae so it is going to be the most common cause of death, most common cause of death, okay? So now cornibacterium diphtheria, either your cardiomyopathy case scenario can be there, or they can give you bull neck appearance, or they can give you bull neck appearance. So why the patient is having a bull neck appearance? Because of lymphadenitis. The patients are having, actually having all the lymph nodes, they're going for a lymphadenopathy, okay? So now, usually these three symptoms, okay, like a respiratory tract illness, like a respiratory tract illness because they are usually transmitted by your respiratory droplets, right? So uh, any patient of Cornibacterium diphtheriae, first the characteristics of the uh, bacterial organism, it's a gram-positive rod, okay? As I told you, Corny is club-shaped and it's going to be found in clumps, okay? It's going to be found in clumps, okay? So they are going to be joined by <coughs> either V or Y-shaped chains, okay? They're going to be joined by either V or Y-shaped chains. Okay, so one important uh, characteristic concept is that the cytoplasm contains metachromatic granules. Okay, their cytoplasm contains metachromatic granules. Okay, so the characteristics of the organism that you have to remember is that it's a gram positive rod and it's club shaped and it's going to have these metachromatic granules and they are going to be in the Chinese characters that is, they are found in clumps in the V shape or the Y shape. Okay, so these are very important and this metachromatic granules they stain with what kind of dye? Your methylene blue. These metachromatic granules, they stain with your methylene blue. Okay, so now coming down to your virulence factor. So I've told you like four presentations with respect to your uh, cornibacterium diphtheria. So now coming to the virulence factor. Virulence factor is diphtheria exotoxin. Okay, so now what we have to remember is this diphtheria exotoxin. 
which is basically encoded by your beta prophage. Okay, by your beta prophage. So now you have to remember this can cause a pseudo membranous pharyngitis. So this is going to cause a pseudo membranous pharyngitis. Okay, how? It's via your tox gene. It's via your tox gene. Okay, so now we have to remember it's going to get that tox gene. Okay, and it's going to cause a pseudo membranous pharyngitis. Okay, so the next toxin that you have to know. So this is called as your diphtheria exotoxin. Okay, diphtheria exotoxin encoded by your beta prophage, which is causing your pseudo membranous pharyngitis. So now you have to know that it's a two unit. Okay, there is a two unit AB exotoxin. <clears throat> so this two unit AB exotoxin is going to inhibit your protein synthesis. How is it inhibiting your protein synthesis? You have to remember it is via the ADP ribosylation of your elongation factor two. ADP ribosylation of your elongation factor two. So now they will ask you what is elongation factor two. Elongation factor two is important or necessary for the tRNA to insert new amino acids, to insert new amino acids into the growing protein chain, okay? So now diphtheria exotoxin, which is basically encoded by the beta prophase, which is causing your pseudomembranous pharyngitis after acquiring like the TOX gene. And then you have to remember this two unit AB exotoxin is going to inhibit the protein synthesis via the ADP ribosylation of your EF2. EF2 is very important because the tRNA is going to uh, join or insert your new amino acids, okay? So how the protein, is growing the growing protein chain is going to join new amino acids <clears throat> so now what's important is that uh, when a patient is presenting with either your respiratory droplets or your respiratory tract infections or your grayish membrane or your bull's neck or your myocarditis okay how do you know or how do you know this particular uh, presentation is because of this particular organism like what are the lab diagnoses i want you guys to remember one is metachromatic granules it's either blue or red <clears throat> metachromatic granules and their gram positive rods so this is one diagnostic criteria second is they are going to be positive for elect test they are going to be positive for elect test for the toxin that they have okay and third is you have to go ahead for your cris you have to go ahead you can go for cysteine telluride agar you can go for cysteine telluride agar and in the cysteine telluride agar you are going to have black colonies in the cysteine telluride agar, you're going to have black colonies, okay? So now what we have discussed is the lab findings. So now in the treatment of your cornibacterium diphtheria, so it is, it's very important that first you give the antitoxin like a passive immunization, okay? So it's going to neutralize the toxin. Next you go for <clears throat> either penicillin or erythromycin if they have the allergy of the penicillin. Okay, next you can go for DPT vaccinations, okay? So now this is the three treatment options that we have. Your diphtheria antitoxin, your, that is your passive immunization is going to neutralize the toxin that the patient is actually having. And you have to remember the penicillin. If the penicillin allergy patient is coming to you, then you can go for uh, erythromycin. And the last is you can remember your DPT vaccinations. Okay, so now I will give a case scenario. Okay, let's say a patient is coming with 13-year-old boy Okay, so he's coming to the pediatrician because his presentation is coarseness, <clears throat> cough, and sore throat. All is there for like one week. Okay, all are there for one week. Okay, so he recently emigrated from India. He recently emigrated from India and he, immunization status is not known. Immunization status is not known. Okay, so now the vitals has been given. There is a fever of 101 degrees that you're noticing in the vitals. The rest are fine. Okay. So now the patient's pulse and BP and everything is fine. Physical examination we did. In the physical examination, what we are able to find is that the patient is having swollen cervical lymph nodes. The patients are presenting with swollen cervical lymph nodes, okay? And the patients are basically presenting with your grayish white membrane that is seen on the pharynx. Grayish white membrane seen on the pharynx, okay? So now let's say cardiac examination is done for the same and the patient is having an irregular rhythm. The patient is coming with an irregular rhythm. Okay, the gram staining of the nasopharyngeal swab is obtained. So when you did the gram staining of the nasopharyngeal swab, what we are noticing is the patient is having a gram positive bacteria and gram positive rod. So now this is a case scenario where a 13 year old boy is coming to the pediatrician because of coarseness, cough, sore throat, and they are coming with uh, immigration from India, then they do not know about the immunization status. And there is a swollen cervical lymphadenopathy and there is a grayish white membrane on the pharynx and the patient is actually having irregular rhythm 
and the nasopharyngeal swab is showing gram positive. So I have given you all the clues together. But in actual examination, you'll only have one or two clues. Okay, so a uh, minimum two clues will be there. Okay, so now you have to remember this presentation. They're asking what is the mechanism of action. The exotoxin, which is responsible for causing this presentation, is inhibiting protein synthesis by what mechanism? So you have to remember the term your adenosine diphosphate ribosylation, your ADP ribosylation. Okay, as I told you, ADP ribosylation of your elongation factor two. Okay, the mechanism by which the exotoxin is inhibiting the protein synthesis is by your ADP ribosylation of the exo, exo that is your elongate, elongating factor too. Okay, so EF2 is very important. You will also be seeing EF2 elsewhere also, like we will be discussing about that. Okay, so let's go for one more question with respect to this. So they can give you, uh, for example, let's say they have given you a case scenario of a cardiomyopathy. Okay, like a patient who is coming with a presentation of cardiomyopathy. And they can also ask you, like, what are the characteristics of this particular organism? Like, why this patient is having uh, this presentation, like, mechanism can be asked. Or they can ask you, like, the characteristic, like, gram-positive rod. Okay, and you have to mention that it's going to have the metachronic granules, metachromatic granules. Okay, so what is the stain? You have to remember methylene blue. So this way of asking questions is also there. Or they can ask you about the media. For example, medium is not discussed here, okay, but I want you guys to remember, let's say a five-year-old female is coming to the ER because of sore throat and malaise, okay, she's been having this presentation for three days, okay, so right now the child is visiting from, let's say, let's, uh, Nigeria, okay, the child is visiting from Nigeria. The temperature is basically 100 degrees. Okay, temperature is 100 degrees. And BP uh, is around 108, 68. Let's keep 30 of respiratory. And pulse is 100. Okay, pulse is 100. So temperature is 100. And your BP is this. Your respiratory rate is 30. And pulse rate is going to be 100. Okay, this is a case scenario for a patient who is coming with sore throat and malaise for three days. Okay, so now when we're doing an examination, I'm able to see that there is a uh, pharynx that is bleeding on attempt. Okay, there is a pharynx that is bleeding on attempt. I'm seeing a grayish white membrane. So this case scenario, they're asking us, what is the culture medium for the diagnosis of this patient's infection? So if they're asking us, what is the culture medium? Then you should go for, I told you cystine telluride agar, low efflux medium with your cystine telluride agar, you have to remember the telluride agar with your low efflux medium. Okay, so that is given as a tableau column, all the culture media with respect to the bacteria. Okay, low flow medium, low flow medium, plus your telluride agar, plus your telluride agar. This is used in conjunction for the culture and the diagnosis of chondibacterium diphtheriae. Okay, so this one preferent, it will basically specifically grow your chondibacterium diphtheriae. And that's going to appear as cream colored colonies. It's going to appear as cream colored colonies. Okay, so when you have your chondibacteria, the telluride agar, it's going to grow gray to black colonies gray to black colonies okay the reason they will ask you like why there is a gray to black colonies it's because of potassium telluride it is because of potassium telluride that is being reduced to metallic telluride it's the potassium telluride okay is being reduced to metallic telluride it's being reduced to metallic telluride that's why you're having this gray black colonies okay so now extra if you guys want to know i'll tell you one more agar it's called as your tinsdale agar it's called as your tinsdale agar so this is can be used to differentiate cornibacterium diphtheria from the other cornibacterium species so if you want to dif differentiate cornibacterium diphtheria from the other cornibacterium species you can use your tinsdale agar so tinsdale agar is going to give us brown to black colonies so this is going to give us brown to black colonies. Okay, so this is one way of asking the questions as well. Okay, so now let's go to the next question. Sorry, uh, next presentation. Okay, so now we have a patient who is coming with listeria monocytogenes. So the important points that you have to remember is that this is a facultative intracellular rod, okay? That means that it's very, very significant for those patients who are having like a cell-mediated immunodeficiency. Anybody you know who are having a cell-mediated immunodeficiencies, immunodeficiencies, you can expect like a gram-positive organism, which is a facultative which is a facultative intracellular rod that is your listeria monocytogenes. Okay, so there are certain characteristic features that you have to know with respect to listeria. When I see a question, I will look for words like rocket tails. Okay, I will look for words like rocket tails. Okay, 
rocket tails or act and rockets both are same only okay i will look for words like tumbling motility tumbling motility because its characteristic is tumbling motility when it is at 22 degrees okay when it is at 22 degrees it's a tumbling motility and i should remember that it grows well in 4 to 10 degrees so this is your fridge temperature right so i remember it's a cold environment that it requires for your listeria to grow so then what you should remember all the refrigerated food that is your meat and pasteurized milk soft cheese raw vegetables all these fridge related foods you have to remember in the exposure okay so now first i told you actin actin rockets or rocket tails okay so that is basically uh, allowing your intracellular movement this is going to be helping in the intracellular movement or cell to cell spread or therefore like without avoiding an antibody how to escape okay that's basically with your rocket tails then they have tumbling motility which is basically seen at 22 degrees celsius okay but in the 4 to 10 degrees that is in your fridge temperature that's where the food and the cheese and the milk and the raw vegetables are there the bacteria is going to contaminate all of that so this is the only gram positive bacteria if you remember i would have told you yesterday this is the only gram positive bacteria which is actually having an endotoxin which allows it to evade phagosome killing okay so this is going to be the only gram positive bacteria so this is going to have your listeriolysin the endotoxin that i'm talking about the name of that is listeriolysin it's listeriolysin o so this is going to allow it to evade your phagosome killing evade your phagosome killing okay so now the cell mediated immunity is usually required to fight an infection right so now what's going to happen so let's say one of the finding if you go uh, put this organism on blood agar the patients are going to be having a very narrow zone of beta hemolysis they can have a narrow zone of beta hemolysis okay this is very important findings or characteristics or morphology of the listeria monocytogenes so now how will a case scenario of listeria monocytogenes been given us i can tell you uh, five into four kind of varieties okay four varieties either it is a pregnant woman or it is a very uh, small infant okay or they can give a immunocompromised or a healthy individual so if we are giving a healthy individual it is self limiting gastroenteritis okay it is self limiting gastroenteritis <clears throat> if it is immunocompromised i've seen meningitis if it is immunocompromised it's meningitis because most commonly you know they will give you a cancer patient or a renal transplant patient okay most commonly a cancer patient or a renal transplant patient if they want to give about your infant they can either give about neonatal meningitis directly or they can give about your granulo granuloma that is causing sepsis okay like it's called as granulomatosis granulomatosis infantica septica granulomatosis infant infanta infanti septica okay so now you have to remember if it's a healthy individual it's self limiting gastroenteritis if it is a immunocompromised individual it's meningitis which is usually seen like the immunocompromised state no they will usually give like a cancer or a renal transplant patient or they can give you any other immunocompromised as well but most commonly i've seen this okay if it is a infant they can give you like neonatal meningitis and they can also talk about your granulomatosis infanti septica okay if it is a pregnant woman they will talk about spontaneous abortion they can give you a case scenario of septicemia and amnionitis amnionitis okay septicemia and amnionitis so this is the presentation so this is the presentation but how is the transmission happening why the pregnant woman should avoid the cold foods why we are saying is because if the patient is actually getting listeria monocytogenes there is a transplacental transmission of it okay either you can have a transplacental transmission or during the childbirth there can be a vaginal transmission during the birth okay so i want you guys to remember the pregnant woman is usually avoid they should avoid the cold uh, delhi foods it's actually because the transplacental transmission and the vaginal transmission that happens during the birth okay so now apart from that i should also remember about the unpasteurized dairy products which can basically cause the same thing as well okay so now i'll just give you a case scenario See, with respect to meningitis we have lots of causes of meningitis with respect to an infant okay so we we can't always expect it's going to be a listeria okay so listeria is like the second and the third causes of neonatal meningitis okay so listeria or because the first cause that i'm always going to think for example i will give you a ta tablo column with respect to your meningitis Oh, sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Just a second.
yeah with respect to meningitis listeria is not the only organism okay so that is because let's say listeria is only seen with your infant or elderly people so when you are thinking about infant is that is anybody who is newborn around 0 to 6 months anybody who is newborn around 0 to 6 months or anybody who is 60 years plus okay so in that only the first cause of 0 to 6 months of meningitis is group b streptococci it's going to be group b streptococci okay then only you have e coli as a second cause the third cause is only dysteria so that's why you have to know about the characteristics of the organism you have to know about what is the uh, cause or the transmission of the organism okay third cause is only your listeria and even with your 60 years plus you have to remember the first cause is strep pneumonia first cause is strep pneumonia second is neisseria meningitis second is neisseria meningitis third is hemophilus influenza type b hemophilus influenza type b and fourth is your group b streptococci and the fifth only is your listeria okay so they will ask you like a general neonatal uh, meningitis or a bacterial meningitis in a 60 plus patient you have to be choosy they are not giving you any bacterial organism as a clue then you have to choose the most common right so that's why i'm saying most common in the newborn it's group b streptococci that is around less than 6 months more than 6 months the first common cause is always streptococcus pneumoniae okay so now one more thing i want you guys to remember is if a patient is suspected with listeria generally for meningitis the drugs that we give is ceftriaxone the drugs that is given is ceftriaxone and vancomycin okay and vancomycin but if they are suspected with your listeria you have to add ampicillin okay so you have to add ampicillin if listeria is suspected okay so when the, this is the bacterial causes of meningitis of course i'm saying you should also rule out the viral causes of meningitis okay so the viral causes in hiv your cryptococcus species is also there okay so the listeria organisms you have to be specific if it's a immunocompromised patient or a pregnant patient or a neonatal patient okay because neonates is where the patients are going to be having the meningitis presentation commonly given so how they will give you a meningitis presentation let's say i'll give you one example for that they are three week old girl she is coming to the er because of fever okay her mother is saying that the girl is very irritable and the girl is not feeding well okay and she is not feeding well and she's been had a upper respiratory tract infection like two days ago okay so after this upper respiratory infection she has been having all these things so now they are asking more about the usual delivery and process they are saying that the girl was born 38 weeks of gestation it was spontaneous vaginal delivery nothing much about that so now we did a lumbar puncture with the symptoms that was given and the opening pressure was said that it's 200 it's 200 water okay and the protein that was present is the protein that was present is 100 okay the glucose that was present is 30 okay the wbc that was present is 1000 okay the wbc that was present is 1000 and 80% of the wbc they are saying that it's neutrophils okay so by mentioning this what they are trying to say is the patient is having a bacterial meningitis so how do we know it's a bacterial meningitis so you have to know that even though the actual meningitis symptoms like you know the nuchal rigidity or photophobia that is all usually seen in the older people this is a very small baby so here the usual symptoms will be fever irritability lethargy poor feeding and these kind of symptoms only okay so now if you look at the glucose value in the bacterial meningitis the glucose will be very low okay so you have to remember when they are saying that it's neutrophils okay and they are saying the glucose is very low so it is more towards the patient who is actually having a bacterial meningitis okay so this is one case of listeria monocytogy so now let's go to your nocardia which is your which is your actinomyces okay so now one more thing i wanted to say ampicillin is generally used but if the patient is immunocompromised you can add a gentamicin to it okay so this is usually as in step 2 if the patient is uh, immunocompromised you can add a gentamicin to it okay so now coming to nocardia which is your actinomyces so this is the tableau column that they have given so i'm not going to read out the tableau column so what you have to know extra is so they usually give this presentation as sulfur granules okay so sulfur granules is nothing but uh, in the presentation sulfur granules are nothing but they are yellow aggregations of organisms bound together by a protein okay so i want you guys to understand just because it's called as sulfur granules it doesn't mean that they have the sulfur in it they actually do not contain the sulfur please understand these sulfur granules is seen in your actinomyces it is not containing your sulfur it is just yellow aggregation so they will not tell you sulfur granules all the time they will just tell you a patient is basically coming with yellow aggregations or yellow mass the yellow aggregations of organisms that is bound together by proteins 
okay so next is a patient who is basically having actinomyces they will come with a mass that is seen in the mandible area or in the jaw area okay so they can tell you about the yellow color finding and they can tell you about the usual characteristics of the organism that it is not it's an anaerobe okay so now you have to remember there is one more thing that they can say that uh, with respect to these two cervico facial actinomyces so they can ask you what is cervico facial actinomyces so this is like a slow growing condition okay you have like a very firm feeling kind of abscess very firm feeling kind of abscess it is usually seen in the face or it's seen in the neck okay neck region or face region and it's going to form like cutaneous sinus tracts and it's going to form like cutaneous sinus tracts okay so now what is important is actinomyces you have to know where all they can present okay so usually where all they are found in your gi oral cavity gi and reproductive right so but what all kind of presentation this i showed you one jaw lesion but they can also give you a presentation of cutaneous sinus tracts okay a patient who's having like an abscess in the face and the neck and then that's forming like a sinus tract so that's one presentation they can also give you a pulmonary actinomycosis so pulmonary actinomycosis is always seen in a lung abscess uh, so what you have to remember is i'll tell you two scenarios here if a patient is having pulmonary actinomycosis okay pulmonary actinomycosis it's going to develop usually following aspiration okay usually it's seen after aspiration this they confuse often with your lung abscess okay with your lung abscess or even say malignancies cancers okay malignancies or even with your tb okay so now you have to look for the microscopic findings there so if you want to prove that it's a pulmonary actinomycosis what is important you have to say that it is filamentous you have to say that it's branching you have to say that it is a gram positive bacteria and you have to say that it's a sulfur granules that is present okay so it's filamentous it is branching it's gram positive bacteria sulfur granules are present so these are all the important points you have to remember so pulmonary antho actinomycosis is actually after aspiration so aspiration related case scenarios they can give you okay so now with respect to nocard nocardiosis nocardiosis is a gram positive rod okay it's either in a beaded or a branching format okay so this gram positive rod either beaded or branching format either beaded or branching format so what you have to remember is it's partially acid fast okay and it is a aerobic organism so now how is a spread or the epidemiology how is it basically seen okay so the epidemiology what you have to remember is it's endemic in soil okay it's endemic in soil okay and the disease is actually via the spore inhalation the disease is via the spore inhalation okay so now this can be because the of the traumatic it can be because of the traumatic inoculation into the skin also you can have a traumatic inoculation into the skin or because of the spore inhalation it is endemic in the soil and it is very commonly seen in immunocompromised and elderly people so these are the epidemiology risk factors that you have to know that it is endemic in soil it is actually uh, the disease is from the spore inhalation or traumatic inoculation into the skin and immunocompromised or elderly patients can have it so now what are the clinical presentations of nocardiosis nocardiosis they have three systems being involved one is lung one is brain another is your cutaneous involvement okay so now it the the way it is very very uh, similar to your tuberculosis why they say it, because it has a pneumonia okay so the patient's nocardia with respect to the lung finding they present as a pneumonia and it's often it's very similar to your tb presentation okay so now they have the cns involvement and the cns involvement is very similar to the brain abscess presentation and they also have a cutaneous involvement so i told you three systems okay so one is a pneumonia kind of presentation another is a cns presentation and another is going to be your cutaneous involvement and if a patient is going to be having your pneumonia okay it's very similar to your tuberculosis it's very similar to your tuberculosis and if it's going to be your cns it's very similar to your brain abscess okay very similar to your brain abscess and if it is a patient who's having cutaneous infections they can just give you a, a skin finding okay in the physical examination okay so now let's say you have uh, gone through the clinical presentations they're asking us about the treatment treatment of the nocardiosis nocardiosis treatment i just want you guys to remember two things one is your try methoprim self methoxazole dmp smx another is surgical drainage of the abscess surgical drainage of the abscess okay so now i will give you guys a case scenario of the uh, one of the tools okay so that we know how the presentation will be done okay let's say we have a 45 year old so we have a 45 
we have a 45 year old man okay so let's say he's coming to the er because he's very intoxicated okay he's very intoxicated and what you're noticing is that the patient is lethargic but the patient is not oriented okay the patient is lethargic or let's keep that he's oriented that will be easier 45 year old man so he's coming to the er he's intoxicated and he's oriented he's lethargic but he's oriented okay so right now we took his vitals the vitals were basically bp is 142 by 86 okay so the rest are fine okay bp is 140 to 86 pulse is 86 okay so now we went into the physical examination his oral hygiene is very bad okay and he's having so many punctate areas he's been having so many punctate areas which is seen on the buccal mucosa and they are expressing a thick and a yellow exudate they are expressing a thick and a yellow exudate okay so now we are looking at the mandible the patient's presentation in the mandible is that they are having like a very non-tender erythematous sperm mass okay they're having a non-tender erythematous sperm mass so we checked for the lymphadenopathy there was no lymphadenopathy okay so a patient who's of a 45 year old man intoxicated okay so he is basically oriented even if he's lethargic he's coming with the vitals of bp 140 to 86 and 86 is a pulse rate let's say respiratory is 16 per minute temperature is 37 degrees okay and pulmonary, uh, sorry, physical examination is showing that there is punctate areas on the buccal mucosa and they're having this thick yellow exudate and the mandible is basically coming with firm non-tender erythematous mass and the patient is having no lymphadenopathy. So now they're asking us what is the diagnosis here. So this is going to be your actinomyces israeli. Actinomyces, actinomyces israeli is going to be causing multiple abscess very commonly in the buccal mucosa, always because of your poor oral hygiene, okay? So this is an anaerobic vessel like just now we said, and it's going to be a long branching filament that's going to resemble like a fungi, or if it's even much more thinner also, okay? So you have to remember the common areas, vagina, mouth, and colon. Vagina, mouth, and colon, they have given it as GI respiratory, no, no, GI oral and reproductive we have given. You have to remember the exact area. So it is usually seen like dental caries or extractions or gingivitis or some gingival trauma, these kind of case scenarios will be there in the background. Or they can also give you like an abscess apart from abscess. You can have the same thing going for your draining sinuses. Okay. So now this is actinomyces is really okay. So with, if you want to compare this with nocardia, nocardia asteroid is going to be like a pulmonary infection or a brain abscess that is going to be seen in an immunocompromised patient. Okay. So that is how this is going to be. So let's go to the next uh, concept. There was a uh, Trophirima vipillae, right? Before all of these, before the mycobacteria. One second. Okay, there is one more concept, Trophirima vipillae. It's basically a gram positive vessel that may stain as a gram negative or it cannot okay so i i'm not sure where exactly they have given that maybe it's there down okay so we will be discussing about that that bacteria what i want you guys to remember for now is so the gram positive bacilli it can't stain as a gram negative or it can stain like at all it, it will not stain at all okay so they will ask you malabsorption syndrome with that they will ask you migratory polyarthritis with that they will ask you neuro neurological symptoms with that and they will also ask you carditis so CVS, neuro, ortho, and your GI, four systems, it gets involved. So this you will be studying in malabsorption. They will say that it's PAS positive and it's foamy macrophages. And they will, you will be talking about like four different types of your malabsorption syndrome, like celiac and your trophirima vipillae. Okay, maybe it is discussed over there. So right now they're starting with uh, mycobacteria. Okay. So with respect to mycobacterium, the major is your primary and the secondary tuberculosis. So first, let me talk about that. Okay. So how will you know that a TB infection is active or it is latent? Okay. What is the clinical manifestation of that? Okay. So first, I'll make a tablet column for that. So you have to remember that if a patient is having an active TB infection, active TB infection, their clinical symptoms, okay, their clinical symptoms is going to be majorly cough. Okay. Their clinical symptoms majorly is going to be cough. Apart from that, they will have constitutional symptoms. So I will just write that as constitutional. Constitutional always means fever, chills, malaise, night sweats, weight loss, anorexia, fatigue. All these 
unspecific symptoms which is not going to help in the diagnosis all the time so these constitutional symptoms of fever chills malaise weight loss night sweats anorexia fatigue all of that can be there okay so now if it is a latent tb if it is a latent tb you have to remember the patient's presentation will be asymptomatic okay they will not have much of clinical symptoms okay so now the tb transmission the tb transmission is possible in an active tb but it is not possible in a latent tb okay the transmission the transmission of your tb is not possible in a latent tb okay so now the diagnostic test is also going to vary okay like the findings are going to be varying okay so now if you take a diagnostic x ray for a patient okay now you have active tb and you have latent tb the first thing is let's say you're doing a diagnostic x ray and in the diagnostic x ray if a patient is actually having an active tb the x ray will be abnormal okay but in a latent tb it is going to be normal okay so let's say next is you're doing a sputum smear or a culture okay you are either doing a sputum smear or you're doing a culture in a active it is going to be positive in a latent it is going to be negative so next is you're doing a tuberculin test skin test okay you are doing a tuberculin skin test and then in the tuberculin skin test what you have to know it's going to be positive for both your active and your latent okay and even if you are doing like a interferon gamma assay even if you are doing interferon gamma assay it's going to be positive for both your latent and active so first is i just wanted to say like what is the difference between your latent tb and your active tb okay your mycobacterium tuberculosis which is basically causing your gon complex okay which is basically causing your gon complex so what is gon complex anybody who's coming with your hilar nodes anybody who's coming with your hilar nodes even sarcoidosis affects your bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy but this is basically hilar nodes plus your gon gon focus gon focus is nothing but uh, usually it is there in the mid or the lower lobes okay usually it's there in the mid or the lower lobes so these both together is only called as gon complex is these both together is called as gon complex which is usually a primary tuberculosis presentation okay so now what you have to remember is this kind of hilar nodes plus your gon focus is your gon complex so this uh, gon focus is nothing but if it's there in the mid or the lower lobe okay so this primary tuberculosis most of the time okay it will it's going to heal by fibrosis there is going to be a calcification okay so now i want you guys to remember this primary tuberculosis most of the times it is going to like more than 90% of the time it is going to heal by fibrosis it is going to heal by fibrosis and there is going to be calcification on it and the tuberculin is positive the tuberculin is positive okay but sometimes this can go for reactivation after that you can have a reactivation which is going to cause a secondary tuberculosis and that's going to present as a fibrocaceous cavity lesion okay you're going to have a presentation of fibro you're going to have a presentation of fibro caseous cavity lesion okay cavity lesion usually in the upper lobe usually in the upper lobe the gon is middle and lower lobe the cavity is in the upper lobe okay so that is going to cause like a full localized destructive disease okay so if it is a primary tuberculosis if it is a primary tuberculosis more than 90% of the patients are healed by fibrosis okay what you have to remember is this classification fibrosis and tuberculin positive okay this can go for a reactivation to cause a secondary tb okay but less than 10% of the people okay who are basically having like aids or basically having your malnourished uh, scenario okay so these kind of people they go for progressive primary tuberculosis the progressive primary tuberculosis it can either become a progressive lung disease where a patient is having like a or an a, a extra added on bacteremia okay so this progressive lung disease what you have to remember is they can have progressive lung disease along with the bacteremia presentation also okay so now you should remember that uh, any of these presentations that is if the patient is having bacteremia they can go for miliary tuberculosis which i will tell you what all will be affected okay so now this is less than 10 patients can go for a progressive primary tuberculosis but more than 90% of the patients go for healing by fibrosis calcification and tuberculin positive okay so now coming to the miliary tuberculosis if they are having bacteremia they can have a miliary tuberculosis which is affecting your meninges okay so miliary tuberculosis will affect your meninges and it will be affecting your vertebrae that's called as your pots disease it will be affecting your lymph nodes it will be affecting your lungs and your liver and your spleen okay so now it is also going to be affecting your adrenal gland okay and it will be affecting all the joints and the bones okay so the reason i'm mentioning all of these things you can have any symptom of any of these uh, systems okay so you have to be knowing that it can affect this much 
your meninges, your lymph nodes, your most commonly you will have even post COVID, we had so many people who are having miniary TB presentation. Okay, like a patient who is having a post COVID uh, presentation of lymph node, okay, lymphadenitis. They had a TB presentation like that. So lungs and liver and vertebrae and meninges and spleen and adrenal gland and joints and long bones are all the presentations which can happen with your miliary tuberculosis. So now what is important is, what is this PPD test? Often they use this terminology. Okay, often they use this terminology of what is this PPD test, whether it's positive or whether it is negative. Okay, so positive means if there is a current infection or a past exposure. Negative means if there is a no infection or it's in a patient who's having sarcoidosis. Okay, so in a patient who's having sarcoidosis or a patient who's having HIV infection with your CD4 count that is low. Okay, that is when your PPD is negative. Okay, so now the next thing what you have to know is they have given about the interferon gamma release assay, which I've already told you in the differentiation with respect to your latent and active TB. So what is the classical presentation of your mycobacterium tuberculosis? They have caseating granulomas. non caseating granulomas is going to be sarcoidosis. So next term that you have to remember is central necrosis. And this is going to be, central necrosis is going to be there with your Langerhans giant cell, with your Langerhans giant cell. Okay, so these are all the histological terms that you have to remember. Okay, so now first I will just talk about mycobacteria in detail before uh, going into these kind of concepts. Okay, mycobacteria, so they all are acid fast organisms. So when I say acid fast, what's the first thing that you know? It is basically pink rod. Okay, it is a, it's a pink rod. Okay, so you have to remember these are all acid fast organisms, which is pink rod. Okay, so now these acid fast stains for, my, for mycobacteria and the smear is first treated with an aniline dye, like that's called as your carbofusion. Okay, if you guys want, you can remember that in the acid fast stain for the mycobacteria, the smear here is first treated with an aniline dye like a carbofusion. Okay, then only the dye is going to penetrate the cell wall and then it's going to bind with the mycolic acids. Okay, so you're going to have the aniline dye. Just I'm giving you one example is carbofusion. It's going to go to the bacterial cell wall. Okay, and it's going to bind with the mycolic acids. It's going to bind with the mycolic acids. Okay, and then you have to remember, then you create the slide and then it's treated with hydrochloric acid and alcohol. And the slide is treated with hydrochloric acid and alcohol. So this acid alcohol will dissolve the outer cell and membranes. So this is going to dissolve the outer cell membranes. This is going to dissolve the outer cell membranes of the bacteria. Or uh, then what's going to happen is the presence of mycolic acid is going to prevent the decolorization, decolorization of your mycobacteria. So what we're doing is first we're taking the acid first stain for the mycobacteria. Okay, the smear is created by the aniline dye. First is we treat with an aniline dye that is carbofusion. And then this dye, okay, it's going to like penetrate your cell wall and it's going to bind with your mycolic acids. So then you treat it with hydrochloric acid and alcohol. Okay, so this acid alcohol combination is going to dissolve your outer membrane. Okay, and then it's you, the still the mycobacteria is going to have the mycolic acid, right? That's going to prevent the decolorization of your mycobacteria. So now you use a counter stain. The counter stain is basically methylene blue. The methylene blue counter stain is then applied and that is going to be taken up by the decolorized bacteria. As a result, you're going to be having this aniline dye that is your carbofusion acid fast stain producing a red color mycobacteria like how it was there in the start. So it is going to be red color if it is a mycobacteria and it's going to be blue color if it is going to be a non-acid fast bacteria. Okay, so because this is very important, like tuberculosis, they ask in and out of it. <clears throat> so you have to know the details of it. Okay, so please remember, uh, your usual aniline dye carbofusion is red in color. The methylene blue is blue in color. Okay, if it is anything that is non-acid fast bacteria, you're going to have it blue in color. If it's going to be mycobacteria, it's red in color. If you remember this line alone, it's more than enough. Okay, so the reason is uh, you know that we have a drug isoni acid. So isoni acid is basically inhibiting the synthesis of your mycolic acids. To be exactly like specific, your isoni acid, which is a part of your ripe therapy that we give for the TB regimen. Okay, so this is the main main mechanism of action is it's inhibiting the synthesis of your mycolic acids. Okay, so now that is why, which is very important for the mycobacterial peptidoglycan cell wall. It is a component of the cell wall. So without mycolic acids, the mycobacteria is going to lose the acid fastness. Okay, that is why they are not able to synthesize a new cell wall. They are not able to synthesize a new cell wall or they can't multiply. Okay, so that is the reason you have to remember isoni acid can be asked with the link of mycolic acids because it's inhibiting the mycolic acids. Okay, so now coming to the types that is already given in the textbook. 
So the types you have to remember is you have mycobacterium tuberculosis, avium, your uh, merinum and your strophilaceum. So this presentation, tuberculosis, we know that it's a pulmonary presentation most commonly. And if it's an avium, it's going to be a patient who's having a disseminated presentation. Okay, if it's a scrofulaceum, it's going to be lymphadenitis. If it is marina, it is going to be hand infection. So we, you have to remember these uh, differentiation because TB symptoms as usual. The same fever, night sweats, weight loss, cough, and hemoptysis. Okay, so now what is important is the virulence factor of the mycobacteria. So they have two factors. One is a cord factor, another is a sulfatide. Okay, another is a sulfatide. So the cord factor is a serpentine pattern. So what is this cord factor? It is responsible for the growth of thick rope-like cord, rope-like cords of mycobacterium organisms. Okay, it is responsible for the growth of thick growth of the thick rope-like cords of the mycobacterium. That is only the serpentine pattern. Okay, so now this correlates with the virulence also because. The mycobacteria do not possess code factor. If they don't possess code factor, they can't cause the disease. Okay, that is why it is actually correlating with the virulence capacity. So code factor is one thing that's very important. And it also can activate your macrophages. Okay, so when it is activating your macrophages, what is the takeaway that it's going to promote your granuloma formation. So when your activation of your macrophages is happening, when there is a granuloma formation, the next is your TNF alpha is going to be released. So the exact clue point is already there in the first state. Okay, like TNF alpha, your granuloma, the macrophages, the serpentine cord. If you remember the cord factor scenario alone, it's more than enough. And the sulfatides are basically nothing but surface glycolipids. Okay, they're going to inhibit the phagolysosomal fusion they're going to inhibit the phagolysosomal fusion okay so i think we will discuss tb with questions okay that's how it's going to help even more okay so let's say first question we have a 54 year old woman she's coming to the er because of the three months of cough okay so i'll write here so we have a 54 year old woman she's coming to the emergency department because for the past three months she's been presenting with cough like a productive cough okay so she's having a productive cough and then she's also saying that she's having like a weight loss of 4.5 kgs okay so she's having a weight loss of 4.5 kgs okay now she's also saying that she's having night sweats drenching in sweat at the night okay so now she's also having rheumatoid arthritis she's also having rheumatoid arthritis okay and that is well controlled by all the medications okay her temperature was uh, 100 degrees okay three months she's having the productive cough and the temperature is 100 degrees okay so now they're also saying that uh the the oxygen saturation in the room air okay the oxygen saturation in the room air is 94 percentage is 94 percentage auscultation of the right lobe was done and you're just hearing the crackles auscultation of the right lobe was done and hearing you're hearing the crackles okay whenever the patient is coughing after the patient is coughing okay so now the x-ray of the chest is taken Okay, the same for the same presentation x-ray is taken. So let's say the x-ray is fibrocaceous cavity. Fibrocaceous cavity in the apex, obviously, of the right law, right upper lobe. Okay, right upper lobe, to put it in a simpler way. So this is a case scenario with a presentation of cough, night sweats, weight loss, and let's say post-tussive crackles, post-tussive crackles, and x-ray presentation of a fibrocaceous cavity lesion. Okay, so now they're asking us, uh, the question is, let's say, what drug was prescribed for the patient's rheumatoid arthritis that led to the complication that she's having right now? So if they ask you that kind of question, it is combining two systems, okay, that what was a drug that was prescribed for rheumatoid arthritis that led to the complication that she's having right now? She's right now having a reactivated TB. Okay, why am I saying she's having a reactivated TB? It's because of the etanercept that is used for the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So etanercept, etanercept, if this can cause TB activation because it is blocking your TNF. Okay, so that is how you have to remember this histological things. Okay, so you have to know it is etanercept, the TB reactivation. You have to remember this is going to block your TNF in a bit. Uh, so they have said TB reactivation is highest in the immunocompromised individual organ transplant and the TNF alpha inhibitor. So I gave you a case scenario where etanercept is a TNF alpha inhibitor. So to build that case scenario, I gave you rheumatoid arthritis as a combined case. Okay, so now this, when you consider for treatment, you should always do a PPD, a purified protein derivative test that is always performed so that they do not have the TB before medication administration, so that they don't have the TB before the medication administrations. Otherwise, the patients are going to be having 
the tnf alpha inhibitor and the tnf is not there the tnf that is tumor necrosis factor decoy receptor when that is not there then the patient's macrophages okay the tnf effectively when it is removed okay the macrophages the reactivation of your tb is going to come into the scenario okay so that is one way of asking the question okay so let's go to the next question so this time uh, a patient is coming like a 34 year old female okay so you can refer to this content here so let's say we have a 34 year old female she is coming to the presentation with two months of fever okay she is having two months of fever and she is also having night sweats and she is also having diarrhea and she is also having weight loss okay so this is a presentation so now she is also hiv positive she is also hiv positive so all of these presentations plus she is hiv positive okay so now they are saying that they have tried all the anti retroviral therapy let's say they have tried the heart but the patient is not compliant with that or let's say there is poor adherence to the therapy of anti retroviral therapy so now you are taking the vitals temperature is 102 heart rate is 94 okay and then bp is 136 by 90 okay so this is a presentation of vitals 102 of temperature heart rate is 94 and uh, your 136 by 90 is a bp so we did a physical examination physical examination is showing a very bad muscle wasting okay and then we did a lab examination it's showing high hiv viral load and it's also showing the cd4 is basically less than 50 Okay, so now you here you are having an uncontrolled HIV with CD4 count that is very bad. So this can increase the infections of opportunistic infections. Okay, this can increase your opportunistic infections, which is more likely. So the presentation is actually pointing towards somebody who is having a disseminated Mycobacterium avium. Okay, so somebody who is having a disseminated Mycobacterium avium. so now you have to remember anybody who are having like a non tb disease in aids often resistant to multiple drugs so here the resistance i didn't give you but i told you that the patients are not adhering properly to the drugs okay so this meaning that they can have uh, when we are seeing this presentation disseminated mycobacterium avium it this can either be mycobacterium avium or mycobacterium intracellular okay most commonly if we are seeing the fever diarrhea abdominal pain this can be both your mycobacterium avium and mycobacterium intracellular okay but adenopathies your adenopathies is not that common is not as common as in more limited mycobacterium avium and mycobacterium intracellular infections okay we have to look for the ct scans the ct scans will tell you like uh, whether what all lymph node enlargement you can see and you can also do like a lymph node culture also okay so these kind of patients mortality rate is actually very high so this is one way of asking your tb questions as well okay so now uh, another question i will ask you okay so now uh, when a patient this is something that you guys have studied in immunology as well let's say we have a 3 year old boy okay so now this 3 year old boy is coming to the pediatric icu unit because he has been having pneumonia and they are saying that pneumonia is because of non tuberculous acid fast bacilli acid fast bacilli and because of that the baby is having a the atypical non tuberculous acid fast bacilli and the presentation is pneumonia okay so right now the identity his identical twin okay his identical twin is also having like hospital ad admissions before and uh, he has uh, had mucocutaneous candida infections the identical twin has had candida infections the identical twin has had salmonella infection salmonella enteritis okay and they are saying that both the parents are healthy okay they are saying both the parents are healthy okay and they are saying the four year old sister is also healthy four year old sister is also healthy so this is a case scenario where the three year old boy is admitted because of the non tuberculous acid fast bacilli okay and they are saying that the identical twin has had similar hospital admissions and they had mucocutaneous candida infections and salmonella enteritis parents are fine sister is fine and now the number of b cells t cells complete blood count immunoglobulin everything is normal okay b t natural killer immunoglobulin complete blood count everything is normal so now they are asking a mutation in which of the following you are going to have the contribution to this particular pneumonia so here you have to remember we have discussed about il12 receptor deficiency in immunology right so this patient is having a il12 receptor deficiency only okay because of the presentation first the identical twin identical twin is having candida and salmonella infections okay so the twin disease suggests that it's a genetic form okay the genetic form of disease okay so now they said the parents in the non twin sibling no they are having a autosomal recessive disorder 
okay so now what we have to remember is anybody who is having like a il12 anybody okay so this is case scenario of il12 that is immunology but why this is important for mycobacterium tuberculosis is anybody who is having an il12 or a interferon gamma anybody who is having an il12 or an interferon gamma receptor mutation you are going to have a severe mycobacterium tuberculosis infection okay you are going to have a severe mycobacterium tuberculosis infection and if you are having any absence or functional defect in the macrophages or if you are having any absence of functional defects in macrophages or if you are having absence of functional defects in t cells then there is going to be increased risk of these intracellular organisms okay so il12 is a autosomal recessive condition so that you have to remember that's why only the twin had the parents and the sibling were fine okay they were not seen with the disease okay so then you have to remember what happens is that in the country sometimes where the bcg vaccination is given sometimes the patients can develop like a very systemic reaction for the bcg vaccination okay so you have to know that il12 receptor deficiency is autosomal recessive okay so when you are going ahead in the countries for the bcg vaccination patients can develop like a severe systemic bcg infection after the vaccine administration itself so that's why it's very very important and this you have to know that all your mycobacterium so what all are the intracellular organisms the mycobacterium the salmonella and your listeria i'm just listing out a few okay so these are all eliminated by your macrophages these are all eliminated by your macrophages in a interferon gamma in a interferon gamma dependent mechanism so which is going to which is going to enhance okay in which your il12 is going to enhance the survival and the proliferation of your natural killer cells and your th1 cells okay you have to remember your mycobacterium your mycobacterium and your salmonella and your listeria which is eliminated by your macrophages it is via the interferon gamma dependent mechanism in which your il12 only is going to enhance the survival and the proliferation of natural killer cells and th1 cells so if a patient is not having this il12 no they have the deficiency so il12 deficiency the number of nk and the number of th1 will not be affected but you will have a defective signaling okay again that is also a very important question i have mentioned this before the number will not be affected but the defective signaling will be there okay which is very 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 important okay so this is one way of asking tb questions as well so now we'll go to the next concept that is if a patient is going to be coming with pure leprosy so leprosy is also called as hansen's disease okay so leprosy is also called as hansen's disease so that is basically caused by your mycobacterium lepre it's an acid fast bacilli that's going to like all the cool temperatures because it always affects the skin and the superficial nerves like a glow and stocking pattern okay so it's like a glow and stocking pattern so you have to remember hansen's disease the glow and stocking pattern the loss of sensation and this is actually diagnosed via a skin biopsy or you can do a pcr okay so you can either do a skin biopsy or a pcr so now what is important is that the reservoir in united states okay so i'm not sure if they have mentioned that here yeah okay so you have to remember the reservoir in united states so you have to know the armadillos so the first mycobacterium tuberculae sorry mycobacterium leprosy your hansen's disease your acid fast bacilli which is basically it likes your cool temperatures it infects your skin and superficial nerves like a glow and stocking pattern i've told you so now how is the transmission of leprosy happening okay so leprosy we have to remember either respiratory or the infection has been your armadillo contact okay in the southwestern united states okay and skin to skin contact okay you either have it via the respiratory or you have it via the skin to skin contact or or via the armadillos it's basically infection can be associated with that armadillo contact in the southwestern side okay so hansen's has two forms okay this you guys know that is one is tuberculoid another is going to be your lepromatous so tuberculoid and lepromatous differentiation is given here itself that's all you have to know okay the most severe form is lepromatous the most severe is lepromatous l is basically lethal okay the lepromatous form okay it means that it is lethal so it presents like diffusely over the skin it presents diffusely over the skin and you can remember l for lethal l for lion like species also called as your leonine l for lethal l for lion like species and it's communicable it's a communicable disease okay and l for low cell mediated immunity okay so that is because uh, the patients i have a low cell mediated immunity but the humoral th th2 response is also okay with the humoral th2 response also 
so a lepromatous which is a more severe form of your hansen's okay so many uh, many times what you have to know is that they are very lethal and they can present over diffusely over the skin they are leonine like species and they are communicable and they have a low cell mediated immunity with a humoral th2 response th2 response okay so now the macrophage signaling how the uh, killing of the mycobacterium leprae is actually done is very limited okay so that's why you have to know that this can cause dissemination because the macrophage killing for the mycobacterium leprae is very limited you can have a dissemination of the mycobacteria you can have a dissemination of the mycobacteria so these are the points you have to remember for lepromatous for tuberculoid the opposite it is going to be your th1 mediated with your intact cell mediated response with your intact cell mediated immunity and it is not that severe it is self limited and it is going to be seen as hypo aesthetic or hairless skin plaques okay you're going to be seen you're going to be seeing your tuberculoid as the points you have to know is hypo aesthetic hypo aesthetic and hairless hairless skin plaques okay so how do you treat this whole presentation you either have dapsin or you either have rifampin for the tuberculoid form for the tuberculoid form you have to know you either have dapsin or you have rifam rifampin okay rifampin dapsin or rifampin for the lepromatous form you have to remember clofazimine is added okay clofazimine is added to it clofazimine is going to be added if it is going to be a lepromatous form okay so i want you guys to remember for dapsin and rifampin okay which is basically your tuberculoid forms and if it is going to be your lepromatous form clofazimine is going to be added okay so there is uh, sometimes they can also give you like a graph of your immune response in your leprosy okay how the lepromin skin test and how the cell mediated immunity th1 response and humoral immunity th2 response is going to be seen with respect to your leprosy okay so i will discuss few more questions on gram positive then i will go for the gram negative okay so let's say let's say we have a 5 day old infant okay it's so the same 5 day old infant they are basically coming with a fever okay i will directly tell the temperature the patient is having 1 or 2 degrees fahrenheit okay the pulse is 130 per minute okay so directly i will tell you physical examination findings okay bp is fine okay a physical examination is that the patient is having very bad muscle tone okay the patient is having very bad muscle tone and the patient's uh, csf finding is how means these are finding opening pressure is normal we found out that opening pressure is normal okay but the glucose is 30 glucose is 30 protein is 120 leukocytes are showing that it is neutrophils 50% and uh, lymphocytes 50% it is 50% 50% equal okay so now culture was done culture was showing that it's a gram positive bacilli it's a gram positive bacilli and they are showing that it's a tumbling motility so now do you understand till now whenever they are seeing this kind of presentation i didn't tell you a scenario like i didn't tell you like any situation here okay but i told you that the patient is having a meningitis so you know that it's a bacterial meningitis when you saw the csf finding but we needed more findings right so now this patient is having an elevated protein elevated leukocyte count and a low glucose which is basically bacterial meningitis elevated protein elevated uh, leukocyte count with your mixed lymphocytes and neutrophils and low glucose is very very important for a bacterial meningitis so bacterial meningitis i told you if it's 0 to 6 months i told you three organisms right so one is going to be your group b streptococci e coli and listeria okay so out of these what you have to remember listeria is the only gram positive bacilli out of these listeria is the only gram positive bacilli because this is gram negative okay so this is a gram positive cocci okay this is a e coli is going to be a gram negative bacilli okay and gram positive cocci is going to be a group b streptococci and listeria is the only gram positive bacilli and listeria is the only thing that's going to have very mild changes in the csf glucose and the protein and they are going to be having both your neutrophils and lymphocytes that range is going to be there okay so maybe the patient's mother was infected with listeria when she was contaminated with the food okay the food contamination when she was pregnant and therefore that is causing that like cheese is there okay unpasteurized milk is there so many options are there maybe that was actually transmitted to the child during the placental transmission or during the vaginal of the vaginal transmission during the birth okay so that is one way of asking this particular question okay so same thing suppose if they want to ask you the group b streptococci they can ask you what is the characteristic okay i told you 
the most common presentation of bacterial meningitis they can ask you what are the characteristic or the findings of the pathogen so then you have to say that it's a gram positive cocci it's beta hemolytic and it's basic present resistant so these kind of presentations can also be asked okay so let's go for one more question okay so now we are having a patient Twenty year old, and they are coming with a presentation of facial lesion. Okay, that is there on the cheek for the last couple of weeks. Okay, so he had a oral surgery that was done around one month earlier. Okay, let's just say that one month before he had a oral surgery that was done. So physical examination was done. It is a non-tender lesion. It is a five centimeter lesion. It is a indurated lesion, and it is a erythematous plaque. It is an erythematous plaque, okay? And you're also seeing that the non-tender five centimeter indurated erythematous plaque, okay? It is coming right now with a sinus tract formation. So when I said this itself, you guys would have known sinus tract formation, LOH drainage. It is going to be your actinomyces, okay? So now let's just keep that the patient is having an actinomyces. If you want, I'll tell again. The patient is basically having a non-tender. A five centimeter indurated erythematous plaque with a sinus tract formation, LOS drainage is basically actinomyces. But now, let's say they have told you after discussing four lines of this, they have told you the patient is diagnosed with actinomyces in the question, and they are saying that the patient was given an antibiotic. So that antibiotic is right now was causing a jarish Hirschhamir reaction. Okay, so when it is used to treat your syphilis or Lyme disease, okay, when it is used this antibiotic. Okay, when we give it for the condition, right now for we are giving it for the actinomyces only. But if this antibiotic is actually used for syphilis or Lyme disease, the patients are going to be having this JH reaction, the Jarrett Schwartz reaction. Okay, so now they're asking what is the mechanism of action of the antibiotic. Okay, so now you have to know what is the antibiotic which is common for both your syphilis and a patient who is on your Lyme disease and your actinomyces. The antibiotic that they're talking about is your Penicillin G only. Okay, so what is your penicillin G side effect? That is your Jarrett Hirschmi's reaction. Okay, so penicillin G. What is the mechanism of action? This is a pharmacology question, but still it's related to microbe. So the uh, mechanism of action is is it going to block your bacterial cell wall synthesis? Okay, they can ask you this kind of questions as well. It's going to block your bacterial cell wall synthesis. Okay, so now <coughs> moving on to the gram negative organisms. <coughs> So with respect to the gram negative organisms, the first thing is all those that is forming lactose. Okay, so gram negative also has the same gram negative lab al algorithm. Okay, so first is you have to divide them into lactose fermenting enteric bacteria. So these lactose fermenting enteric bacteria only is your Klebsiella, E. coli, Enterobacter, Serratia, and everything. So that they would have given it here. Okay, they're starting with Neisseria. Maybe I'll start from there. So that they would have given it lactose fermenting enteric bacteria they would have given us a group okay so you have to remember gram negative is either divided into diplococci coccobacilli or your comma shaped organisms okay so here the positives that you have to remember whether it is oxidase positive or whether it is lactose fermenting or whether it is maltose utilization okay so i want you guys to remember this because it's a direct memory okay so now let's go to your neisseria organisms neisseria you have to remember gonococci and meningococci okay so now both uh, Neisseria gonococci and meningococci, they ask in and out, okay, it's very big with respect to the number of questions they ask on this, okay, the reason is because, first I'll tell you the characteristic of the organisms, so this is a gram-negative diplococci, it is going to metabolize your glucose, as they have said in the first line, it's a gram-negative diplococci, it's going to metabolize your glucose, and it's basically, the meningococci, the meningococci can basically meningococci can basically ferment your maltose and glucose maltose and glucose okay you have to remember both maltose and glucose but gonococci is going to ferment only the glucose okay so this is maltose and glucose gonococci is only glucose okay that is the one differentiation you have to remember maltose and glucose gonococci is only glucose okay so next is culture on the blood agar the culture on the blood agar is going or the uh, vpn thyme the agars that we have one is blood agar Another is VPN or Thayer Martin. Thayer Martin Agar. What is VPN? Vancomycin, polymyxin, nistatin. Okay, vancomycin, 
polymyxin nystatin vancomycin polymyxin nystatin okay neisseria only grows uh, neisseria only gene that grows on it okay that's why with selective media you have to remember so the gram negative diplococci which is metabolizing your glucose okay all are going to metabolize glucose meningococci is only maltose and glucose gonococci is only glucose okay but you have to remember it's an intracellular organism it is present within the neutrophils it is present within the neutrophils intracellular organism it's going to have a blood agar a vpn agar and thiamartan agar okay you have to know this vpn is actually selective okay that is your vancomycin polymyxin nystatin okay so now i will talk about the virulence factors then i will go about the disease presentations okay virulence factor they have iga protease okay they have lipopolysaccharides and they have pili okay and they have pili and they have opa attachment okay so four things you have to remember iga protease is basically for the oropharynx colonization okay it is for the oropharynx colonization so that is done iga is just oropharynx colonization the lipo oligosaccharides the lipo oligosaccharides okay they basically have a endotoxin activity so this outer membrane lipo oligosaccharide of the neisseria it is very similar or anal analogous it's a very analogous to your lipo polysaccharide of the gram negative rods okay of the gram negative rods okay but the only thing is that it doesn't have the repeating o antigen it doesn't have the repeating o antigen okay so the outer membrane that is your lipo oligosaccharide of your neisseria of your neisseria is very analogous to the lipo polysaccharide of the enteric of the enteric gram negative bacteria the only thing is that it lacks it lacks your repeating o antigen it lacks your repeating o antigen so this is what is responsible for all the sepsis meningitis meningococcemia okay because it is going to interact with the t lr in the macrophages it is causing the sepsis meningitis meningococcemia everything is because it's interacting with the tlr of the macrophages the blood level of lo was should always be monitored just a second uh i have to change the network one second so now pili so what is the virulence factor of pili pili is going to enable the nasopharyngeal attachment okay so pili is important for the nasopharynx attachment okay so then you have to remember it has a very high antigenic variability it has a very high antigenic variability so that it can avoid the immune response there is no vaccination that is available and it enables the Like the epithelium and enter the circulation. That's why it's important for the penetration of your epithelium and enter the circulation. Okay, so you have to remember it enables the nasopharynx attachment, nasopharynx attachment. Okay, and increase in your antigenic variability, so we don't have the vaccine for it, and it enables the bacteria to penetrate the mucosal epithelium and enter the circulation. This pili. Okay. so what is your opa attachment opa attachment proteins are for the tighter attachment to the epithelium so they attach to the epithelium very tight for the tighter attachment to the epithelium you have to remember this okay so now in a very uh, uh, easier way i'll tell you this whole tablet column you have to remember the tablet column fully okay which is already given here no polysaccharide capsule no maltose no vaccination okay that is because of the antigenic variation of the pilus okay so now it is sexually or perinatal transmission this is via the respiratory and oral transmission okay so this is going to cause your gonorrhea septic so i am going to be discussing about these clinical things in detail okay so let's say gonorrhea so how will a patient have a presentation of gonorrhea in a male obviously and uh, next is women okay so the symptoms that they will give for gonorrhea in a male and women so both will have fever both patients will have high fever okay and uh, if it is a male the patients will have urethritis okay the patients will have prostatitis okay and the patients will have epididymitis okay the patients are going to have your epididymitis okay they also have orchitis okay they also can have orchitis okay 
So urethritis, prostatitis, epidermitis, orchitis is a presentation of gonorrhea in a male. Gonorrhea in a female is going to be fever. They will have endocervicitis, endocervicitis, okay. They will have PID. They were going to have a creamy and a purulent discharge. So this PID can always cause a ectopic pregnancy, okay. They can give you ectopic pregnancy ruptured case scenario also, okay. Purulent discharge, you have to remember the creamy and the purulent discharge can be given as a case scenario. So this is a gonorrhea and a man. And present, okay. After the fever, you have to remember a male women service itis and the ID, which is scarring, it's going to cause infertility and it is going to cause ectopic pregnancy. Okay, that PID is not in respect to the two infertility and your uh, important is ectopic pregnancies. Okay, so now coming to the gonococcal cervicitis. So, how will a patient of gonococcal cervicitis present? Okay, gonococcal cervicitis. Okay, so this is a patient of anybody who's coming with a pure or a mucopurulent discharge. Cervix. Their presentation will be cervix. Okay, they have bleeding. That is what I'm trying to say. That is if they are. cervix is basically intermenstrual bleeding or they are having postcoital bleeding okay they are having postcoital bleeding so this is a clinical presentation of gonococcal cervicitis okay so now because i didn't mention that along with your women right so the diagnosis is either you go for your nucleic acid amplification testing that is your nat okay you have to go for nucleic acid amplification testing and the empiric treatment what you have to remember is it's either a third generation cephalosporin third generation cephalosporin you have to remember or you can you go for plus an azithromycin and a doxycycline plus you can go for an azithromycin or doxycycline or okay or doxycycline okay that is gonococcal cervicitis now if the patient is basically having neonatal conjunctivitis how is the presentation that you have to remember neonatal all the neisseria gonorrhea discussions i'm going one by one so we have discussed gonorrhea let's go for neonatal and your septic okay so maybe i'll go in the order septic arthritis the patient will have a asymmetric polyarthritis. The patient's presentation will be asymmetric polyarthritis that is affecting your large. Okay, and they will tell you that the male is sexually active. They will be a male who is sexually active. Okay, and then they will tell you that the joint, the joint tap was done, and that showing that is a purulent synovial fluid. Okay, and they say that. It is not gram staining because the bacteria is intracellular. It is not gram staining because the bacteria is intracellular. Okay, this is the presentation they can give for septic arthritis. So you just have to take and remember these. Okay, it's like joint points only. Asymmetric polyarthritis, usually affecting the large joints, sexually active adults. The sexually active adults itself, usually your point of direction is going to change. Joint tap showing purulent fluid. Purulent is basically most of the bacterial infections and it doesn't gram because the bacteria is intracellular. So you have to remember the bacteria is intracellular. Okay, the next thing they have given is neonatal conjunctivitis. So that will be like anybody who's having within five days. That is very, very, very important. Okay, so within the first five days of their life, okay, when compared to chlamydia, chlamydia has actually taken more than seven days. Chlamydia takes more than seven days for the neonatal conjunctivitis, but your neisseria gonorrhea takes less than five days. So any infant with less than five days having a rapid blindness, if they're not treating it and you use erythromycin as your eye drops, you use erythromycin as your eye drop. So this is the only clues that will be there in neonatal conjunctivitis. But conjunctivitis symptoms and all there, no, the full the redness, everything they can talk about that for two lines. Okay. So next is osteomyelitis is also equally important, even though it's not mentioned here. You have to mention osteomyelitis is less common, but it's a very important part of it. Okay. So next coming now is your Fitz Herx Cutis syndrome. So now this is nothing but a hepatic inflammation the patients are going to have a hepatic inflammation okay it's a complication of pid only when it's going and spreading to the peritoneum so this pid when it's going into the peritoneum it's going to be a trans abdominal spread of pid that's when you have a hepatic inflammation with a right upper quadrant abdominal pain and the patients are going to have the strings that's called as your vile violent strings okay the, the addition looks like a string there Okay, it's called as violent strings of other shins that's seen in the liver. So that is going to be the fitz hogg cutter syndrome. So now the next is, one second.
yeah the next word you have to know is a disseminated gonococcal infection or this disseminated gon infection so that to be a triad that is going to be have poly arthralgia and you have a skin lesion and you have tenosynovitis you have have a tenosynovitis or you have a purulent arthritis or you have purulent arthritis okay purulent arthritis okay disseminated gonococcal infection if you're either having purulence without the skin lesion without the skin lesion okay so you have to remember that your disseminated gonococcal infection is one of the most common causes of septic arthritis it's a one of the most common causes of septic arthritis that they keep asking you okay so the neisseria gonorrhea uh, the treatment choice i told you septriaxone and azithromycin right so septriaxone nearly all cases of isolated gonorrhea we try to add on like azithromycin it's recommended because of the resistance that we have against this aflosporin so, and one why we are adding this in the very very okay, the reason Azithromycin is because of the resistance that we can have cephalosporin. Apart from that, you have chlamydia infections. Okay, you have to try to protect against your chlamydia co-infections. Okay, for the neonatal conjunctivitis, I told you erythromycin eye drops. Okay, so now if the sexually active woman is less than twenty-five and if there are multiple sexual partners, the partners who are infected should also be screened. Okay, okay. so the thing. the point with respect to your uh, ectopic pregnancy is that so let's say ectopic pregnancy is one thing that i haven't discussed because pid can cause ectopic pregnancy so how will the pregnancy case scenario come and give you us they will come with a presentation of abdominal pain okay they will have vaginal bleeding you should look at the vitals the vitals will be very unstable hemodynamic instability hemodynamic Yes, I'm sorry. My net package got disconnected. Okay, so I was saying with the nucleic acid amplification testing, what you have to take away is that you take the urine, the male urine or your urethral specimen or female urine or vaginal specimen or your endo cervical specimen to detect the virus or the bacterium. Okay, so this is very important uh, for the testing of Neisseria gonorrhea. one more thing with respect to neisseria as your neisseria meningitis that we haven't discussed with respect to meningitis the gain of axis you have to remember so they actually have the gain of axis by colonizing the pharynx okay they will first start with the pharynx then they go to the blood then the choroid plexus then the meninges okay so the reason i'm saying this is 
Hemophilus influenza will also cause meningitis, but that it will start with the pharynx, they go to the lymphatics and they go to the meningitis. Okay, the different route of your nasal meningitis and your hemophilus influenza both reaching the meningitis meningitis both start with the pharynx, but the nasal goes via the blood, choroid plexus, and meninges. Okay, blood, choroid plexus, and meninges. But if you take that in a patient of hemophilus influenza, it's going to be your pharynx, lymphatics, and meninges. Okay, pharynx, lymphatics. Okay, hemophilus is lymphatics, nasal is basically blood. So that differentiation will try to uh, give you a clear cut differentiation between whether it is a hemophilus influenza or nasiria. Like uh, apart from that, you're still going to be having that that nasiria meningitis is polysaccharide capsule. It's a maltose fermentation. It's going to be having your respiratory or oral transmission is going to be there. You have Waterhouse Prediction syndrome. So what is Waterhouse Prediction syndrome? It's an adrenal insufficiency which is basically caused by the nasiria meningitis, and that is a very acute presentation also. Okay, so here. Uh, this waterhouse predation will be starting with the endocrine anyway when we have adrenals, okay? But I want you guys to remember, gonorrhea can be asked with so many different variations. Meningitis is always either adrenal presentation or a CNS presentation, and they can ask you what is the complication. Like they will give you a case scenario of a patient who is having like a, a gangrene of the toes, okay? And they're telling you that they've also had like an episode of adrenal insufficiency. They're asking you what is the complication. So you have to remember the DIC and the shock presentation also. So usually the gangrene of the toes, I think they would have given a picture also. Okay, they can give you this kind of presentation. You might not always think about nasal meningitis when you see this gangrene of the toes. So I want you guys to remember gangrenous toes, okay, and your petechial hemorrhages, okay. Meningococcemia's petechial hemorrhages. So that is the first thing I want you guys to remember, the gangrenous toe and all the petechial hemorrhages that you have seen here, that is your nasal meningitis, apart from the presentation of your adrenal insufficiency and meningitis, okay? So this is your Neisseria meningitis. For gonococcal, it is septic arthritis, gonorrhea, neonatal conjunctivitis, PID. PID can cause infertility and ectopic and fixed herbs cutis syndrome. And I told you about the gonococcal disseminated disease because that is a most common presentation with your septic arthritis in a sexually active young woman, okay? So I'll stop the class here. Tomorrow we'll be discussing about hemophilus influenza We'll be covering all the gram negative for one hour and we'll be doing just questions for one hour, okay? Tomorrow will be a two hour class. We can keep it from five to seven if you guys are fine with that, okay? If anybody can't come from five to seven, please let me know. And uh, Sunday, we will be discussing about mycology and parasitology. Thank you, guys.